Hello and welcome everybody to PayPal and Patreon down below if you want to support me, only do so if you actually can. Quick note, just before we start, the Precious Metals and also the Rare Earths and Strategic Metals bundle classification, those two groups have already had their own specific videos like this one, so all the metals here are just the normal metals, as you could call them, that fall outside of those two categories. Down below and on screen later, I will leave links to the other two if you want to see those. But anyways, going down this list, starting with the one that you probably think is the most abundant in the Earth's crust, but are actually wrong, iron. Our bulk civilizational construction enabling metal, as it is the core elemental component of steel. Something like around 95 plus percent of iron is consumed to make steel. Steel being an incredibly strong metallic alloy formed by, at its most basic level, a combination of majority iron plus an addition of roughly 1% carbon and 1% manganese. And then various other types of specialized steel alloys are made by adding other percentages of other metals like chromium, nickel, vanadium, molybdenum. But steel formed by majority iron and what most iron is used to make is the foundational component of our infrastructure, our buildings, many of our vehicles. Outside of steel, you will find iron in some other large uses, one of the primary ones being weights. And while that does include exercise equipment weights, the function of weights that actually takes up a better part of usage is for balancing weights used on vehicles and construction equipment, especially cranes. Since cranes are lifting really heavy weights, off in one direction. It would otherwise leave them majorly unbalanced and uh, prone to tipping over. So giant slabs of, in a lot of cases, iron are placed on the opposite end of them to balance them out. And in smaller but no less critical uses, various iron salts are used in our water purification and treatment processes. Iron catalysts are critical to the nitrogen fixation process, which is our industrial process of extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere to make nitrogenous fertilizers, one of the three big core ones that allow us to grow so many crops so quickly in the modern age. Now, moving on to the metal that is actually the most abundant in the Earth's crust, aluminum. A huge portion of aluminum is used as the primary structure material of vehicles, from ground vehicles, cars, trailers, to especially aviation, aircraft, as aluminum itself is actually a lot stronger than people initially think it is, and also it's easily strengthened with the addition of magnesium and manganese, and in the case of aviation, scandium. So aluminum is used as the bulk material for vehicles, although particularly in passenger cars, the skeletal framework is usually high strength and ultra high strength steel, Aluminum is also used in structures, in construction, in buildings, particularly in things like air ducts or anything that's high up on upper floors, in attics, or in the case of like stores suspended from the ceiling, again because of its low weight. It is also actually aluminum wire that is used for transmission power lines. Once the wire goes into the ground or it's actually in buildings or anything, then it is copper because copper is a better conductor. However, aluminum is used for long-range transmission for long distances. It's also used in different kinds of packaging, whether for the general container itself, or in terms of protective insulation. Lastly, it finds its way into in different medicines and medical treatments, along with hygiene and cosmetic products. Next up is zinc. Zinc is roughly half of the global consumption of zinc is for galvanizing metal, primarily steel, although in a lot of cases some aluminum also gets galvanized. Galvanizing being a process where whatever you are galvanizing, whatever structure it is, is lowered into a pool of molten zinc and raised out, the molten zinc clinging to it, then rapidly cooling into an outer protective layer, leaving the metal or the material with a speckled appearance like such. The purpose of this being as a protective layer against corrosion, oxidization. A decent chunk of zinc is also used in the metal alloy brass, which is used for things like doorknobs, drawer handles, plumbing, especially plumbing fixtures and pipe joints. 
Although in the case of those that you interact with, like faucets and shower heads and stuff, usually they won't appear brass because they've typically been given a chrome plating on top of them. It's also predominantly used in the die casting process. Though initially the first thing that comes to a lot of people's minds is the making of models of various kinds. The bulk consumption in the die casting category for zinc is for mechanical and engine parts that need to be made into a very specific complex shape that in itself does not contain moving parts. It is also used as a coloring pigment in different paints. Along with manganese, it is one of the critical chemical components of alkali batteries, and it is a necessary component of many different medicines and hygiene products. And then we have copper. The bulk of copper usage, roughly 60%, being, as you probably guessed right off the bat, for wire, electrical wiring. Copper is also largely used in brass, or a large part of it is, as brass is primarily a copper-zinc alloy. Copper itself is also directly used in plumbing, a lot of pipe work, various factory equipment and machine parts. It's used as a small percentage additive in different alloys, like for example weathering steel or brown steel, and it is also the crucial component of anti-fouling paint, which is that red paint that is applied below the waterline of ships, the purpose of which is to prevent sea life, particularly barnacles, from clinging to the underside of the ship. Lead is predominantly used between 80 and 90 percent for lead acid batteries, most of which are used for ground vehicles, yes. However, battery banks of lead acid batteries are also used for cell towers and communications towers, as they just serve the function best in those particular cases. It is, although it's a much smaller percentage than people think of lead usage, it is the primary component of ammunition, of bullets, tank shells, artillery shells. However, in total, that only makes up about 3% of lead consumption, and it is still used in soldering for electronics, though to a much smaller degree now. The role that it used to fill in larger percentages predominantly being filled by bismuth. Nickel. You hear me, if you've been around the channel for a while, most frequently talking about nickel's use in batteries, lithium-ion batteries, particularly the bulk consumption coming now from EV batteries, the production of which is rapidly increasing. However, the bulk majority of nickel consumption is still as a steel component. It is one of the key ingredients of various types of stainless steel, which isn't, despite it being spoken of in society like such, something that was made for appearance. Stainless steel was made for an actual purpose that is resisting corrosion. With the typical extra additives to stainless steel on top of what normal steel usually contains, being 18% chromium and about 10% nickel. So stainless steel is used in waterworks, in infrastructure that's right next to the coast, aka near salt water, in offshore or underwater infrastructure, in ships, and usually in anything around or having to do with food, such as quote-unquote silverware, which despite us calling it silverware, I promise you there is not that much silver on this earth. It is actually stainless steel. Those of you who work with tools a lot, been around a lot of nickel as well in the form of nickel-cadmium batteries, as they are the primary choice for power tools, or compared to other batteries like, say, lithium-ion batteries, they can release a lot more power more quickly. It is also the primary component of the appropriately named nickel super alloys, which are exceptionally strong, exceptionally heat-resistant, exceptionally corrosion-resistant materials, most of which being used in aircraft engines and in power plant turbines, and it's also used as a plating material being applied in a very thin, micro-thin layer to the outside of various things to give extra corrosion resistance. Tin, which we inappropriately attribute to a lot of things. Tin in the present day is predominantly used, roughly half of global consumption, as the key component of solder, which is a binding material for electronics components and for smaller piping, as tin both has a very low melting point and it is also exceptionally adhesive binding easily to almost every other metal. It is also used as one of the multiple sealing layers of lawn shelf life food cans and other containers in the form of tin plate. It is a smaller additive component to different types of brass alloys. It is also a small additive component to the particular lead alloy that is used for the grids in lead acid batteries, 
It is also used, particularly used as in heated up into a molten layer, for the manufacturing of glass, or at least most of our modern glass, which is nice, perfectly flat glass, which in particular is enabled by floating it on a layer of molten tin. It is one of the key elemental components of indium tin oxide, which is the nanoconductive material that effectively is what allows the existence of flat screens, and also touch or interactive screens. It's also one of the layers of solar panels. Manganese, I mentioned before, has one of the key base ingredients of steel, and that is its predominant usage, is as a steel additive. It is also a key additive component for aluminum alloys. Similar to steel, it adds strength to the aluminum, and about 10% of manganese is used in batteries, with a quickly growing percentage of that being EV batteries, and normal alkali batteries, as I already mentioned, are a chemical reaction of zinc and manganese. It is used as the pigment in various paints, and is also a chemical catalyst for the production of various types of chemicals, too many to list. Cobalt is predominantly used in lithium-ion batteries, although they do not require it. Having cobalt makes their performance more efficient than they would be without it. So EV lithium-ion batteries, also grid-scale storage batteries, since we are chasing that road now, and just regular lithium-ion batteries for devices and stuff. That is the bulk of cobalt's use. It is also one of the key components of the aforementioned nickel superalloys, necessary for the existence of power plant turbines and aircraft engines. It is used as a blue pigment. It's the key ingredient of samarium cobalt magnets, which are those that are used in and effectively allow the existence of microphones, speakers, headphones. And it is used as a chemical catalyst for the desulfurization of oil and natural gas, and also as a catalyst in the production or synthesis of plastics. Chromium, I mentioned before, is one of the primary ingredients of stainless steel, and that particular use comprises 85% of global consumption. Chrome plate, or chromium plating, I mentioned as well, a, a micro-thin outer plating of chromium being applied to other things. You'll particularly find it applied a lot to plumbing fixtures. However, you will also find it used in vehicles as an outer coating layer to wheels, as extra protection for their metal against corrosion, and a lot of times in motorcycles as well, as a lot of the motorcycle's components are outside in the elements directly exposed. It is also used as a pigment in various different paints, and as a catalyst in the petrochemical refining processes to make a whole bunch of different things. It is used alongside arsenic as one of the primary wood preservatives or wood treatments, which is what gives you that green wood appearance to a lot of wood that you'll see that's outside all the time. It's a type of protection that keeps pests and especially termites away as the biggest concern. And it is used in the form of chromic acid to wash some factory equipment and also lab equipment, as that particular compound is one of the only things that will remove absolutely all types of residue that would otherwise interfere with further processes. Molybdenum, you heard me mention as well, it is also a key additive to different types of steel. It is particularly used in structural steel, such as I-beams and the like, and in the steels used in tools and construction equipment. It's also one of the key ingredients of nickel superalloys, and about 14% of molybdenum is consumed as chemical catalysts, the synthesis process of various petrochemicals and industrial chemicals. It finds its way into mechanical grease or lubricant, and it is applied in a microthin layer as a special coating on the glass of high-efficiency solar panels. Vanadium is another steel additive for special steel alloys. About 85% of its consumption is for steel. In particular, it is used for tool and equipment steels, as vanadium especially gives extra impact strength, and it is also used in vehicle steels, in the extra high strength steels that prevent the vehicles from collapsing because of its impact strength. It is used as a chemical catalyst in the production of sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is actually one of the foundationally key industrial chemicals that is, that is one of the various reactants or components of the manufacturing or synthesis process of many, uh, so many of the different things that you use even in your average day. 
Vanadium is also used as a petrochemical catalyst as well. It has a growing use in vanadium redox batteries, which are part of the whole grid storage battery road that we're trying to chase that isn't going to end very well. If you want to look into that specifically, there's a link up in the corner to a video about uh, all the resource math and inadequacies math behind the whole green energy electric vehicle only road that we're trying to chase down. It is a key additive to infrared blocking glass, as well as a usual additive in different titanium alloys. Zirconium. You're probably most familiar with it in the form of cubic zirconium, which is one of zirconium's main uses, making imitation jewelry. The bulk, more than half of zirconium's use, is actually not in a typically thought of metal form, but actually as one of the key components of specialty bricks, refractory bricks, or wall material. Refractory being material that is used to contain high temperatures, so the material that's used for the inside of industrial furnaces, and also those giant ladles or buckets that you see in various metal mills carrying the molten metal. So zirconium is one of the key components of that material. It's also used in some control rods of nuclear reactors. It's used as foundry sand or molten metal mold casting sand. It's one of the abrasive surface materials that makes sandpaper. And it is applied along with yttrium, which you will find mentioned in the Rare Earths and Strategic Metals video, link to that above now. It is applied alongside yttrium as a heat protective ceramic coating on the inside of combustion chambers for aircraft engines. Magnesium finds its primary use as a additive to aluminum alloys. As I mentioned, usually they contain about 1% magnesium. It's also used in steel production for the process of desulfurization or removing sulfur from the iron as it's being turned into steel. It's the key component of bright burning flares, whether standard illumination flares, rescue flares, or aircraft anti-missile defense flares. It along with zinc is one of the key die casting metals, again for making metal components of specific complex shapes. It's a key chemical component in the refining process of titanium, along with that of uranium as well, as well as a primary component of numerous types of explosives. Niobium is primarily used as a steel alloy additive, particularly for high strength and then extra slash ultra high strength steel. It's also one of the smaller additives of nickel super alloys, typically up to about 6% composition. It's one of the primary components of superconducting magnets, which are used in particle accelerators, lasers, whether in laboratory settings or in factory or production settings, and for maglev trains as well. Lithium. About three quarters of lithium is used for lithium ion batteries, its most famous usage, combining both the amounts from EV batteries and from regular lithium ion batteries. A tiny percentage of it is used as medication. Some additional percentage of it is also used in cookware ceramic or food handling ceramic that's going to be in high temperatures and as one of the functional components of some types of mechanical grease and lubrication. Beryllium, which has been firing up in price recently, is a rare metal. Its primary thing, very high strength aerospace alloys, specifically those used in military applications, in combat aircraft, and in missiles, as well as also in rockets and space vehicles. It's one of the alloy components for non spark tools or tools that are used for mechanical work in extremely flammable environments where no sparks can be tolerated. It is one of the key protective insulator layers for the repeater nodes along the fiber optic cables running across the seafloor that allow the existence of modern instantaneous communication that you're utilizing right now by watching this video. And it is also used in electronics as an extremely small additive percent to particular contacts used in the electronics specifically spring contacts that will be getting pressed a lot, as without the addition of beryllium, they would not retain their spring memory and would gradually just deform. Arsenic, as I mentioned before, is a small additive component to the particular lead alloy that is used in lead acid batteries. It is also in a similar small percentage part of the alloy used for ammunition. Combined with chromium, it's part of the lumber treatment for specifically outdoor application lumber, 
to ward off pests and termites. Mercury. And additionally, von Metal that I unintentionally breathed in a bunch of once when a fluorescent bulb uh, semi-exploded in my face. It's used in one of its primary uses, uh, fluorescent bulbs, whether regular tube fluorescent bulbs or compact fluorescent lights. It is used in some specific types of astronomy telescopes, and it is used for gravity switches, typically or at least most typically used on aircraft, as mercury is not magnetic, so it won't be influenced by outside stuff other than gravity, or i.e. angling or tipping of the aircraft. Titanium, to the surprise of some people, is actually mostly not used as a metal. 95% uh, of titanium is just used for white paint. And yes, you heard that correctly, over 90% of titanium is just used for white pigment. Now beyond that, it is also used as a high-strength lightweight metal for various aircraft alloys, especially military, and for naval and submersible applications, especially military submarines. It is the chosen material for industrial processing tanks or chemical vats, as it's much more resistant to chemical corrosion than the different types of steel, and it can also handle more pressure. And in a much smaller, tinier percentage of its usage, it is used as biomedical implants or joint replacements. Antimony is primarily, although it's being replaced, still used in the form of its trioxide compound as a flame retardant or a coating added into or mixed into materials that prevents them from at least burning as much as they otherwise would have. It is also one of the key additive components to the lead alloy used in lead acid batteries, as well as in ammunition. It's now used a lot in soldering alloys for electronics and piping, and in much smaller percentage uses, but still quite useful uses. Micro or nano additive to electronic screens, as its addition during their manufacturing prevents the formation of any bubbles that would then otherwise cause deformation. And it is one of the sensor materials needed for thermal imaging or infrared detectors. Bismuth is primarily still predominantly consumed in the medical, paint, and cosmetic industries, although its usage in soldering alloys to replace lead is quickly rising, and it is also a petrochemical catalyst in the production of the different types of acrylic compounds. Tungsten. Tungsten is a very hard, very high melting point metal. Its primary things is its usage in tungsten carbide tools, along with equipment. It's also an additive component in specific types of super alloys. It's the primary material for the welding electrodes in the arc welding process. It's used in control and regulating rods in nuclear reactors, and also in the reactor vessel itself. It's used in the military capacity in the form of penetrating munitions. A tiny bit of tungsten is used to form the glass to metal seals, and typically around you, you'll see this most frequently anywhere you find small singular LED lights, and it is one of the components for sensors to detect different gases, as well as pH meters, or acidity slash base meters. Cadmium. Cadmium's most predominant use is in nickel cadmium batteries that we mentioned before, most commonly used in tools, also used in nuclear control rods, used as a protective plating on steel that's used in aircraft components, and its most rapidly growing use is in cadmium telluride, which is used for high-efficiency solar panels, or quote-unquote solar power plants. Tantalum. Tantalum's most predominant use is in electronics capacitors, a critical component finding the way into phones, computers, everything. It is another one of the additives for different types of super alloys, as well as for specific types of carbides used in specific tools, and is also the chosen metal for pipes carrying corrosive liquids. All right, now that is the end. So thank you everybody for sticking around and listening. Like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you haven't already. A link is up in the corner now to the precious metals uses video and I will include both the Precious Metals and Rare Earths slash Strategic Metals video links down below as well. PayPal and Patreon are down there if you want to support me, only do so if you actually can. Also go subscribe to my Catch channel as well, 
We're probably past the deadline for her monetization, but still like to try to get her up to a thousand subs so we can hopefully get her monetized in the future. And no matter what happens to me anyways, may God bless and protect all of you, and I will see you all around next time.